In the last lectures, we discussed two sections of polity. One was the king and the other was the revenue, the tax. Today, we'll talk about the third important thing of polity, that is justice. The theoretical basis of Hindu um, law was dharma. And dharma means righteousness. An all-inclusive concept which defined the norms of man's entire personal, familial, professional, social, civic and religious life. Dharma, however, was not a unified concept. Its prescription varied from caste and community, trade and profession, sect and clan, and from region to region. A, what was dharma for one group could be adharma, non-righteousness for the another one. But each group was free to live by its own dharma, however divine it might be from the dharma of the other groups. Law in classical India had three recognized sources. The sacred canon, social customs and royal decrees in that order of precedence. Custom could not be in violation of the canon and royal decrees could not be in contradiction to canon and established customs of the culture. And there was thus a neat hierarchy in Hindu legal system. But this did not mean clarity or precision in law, for there was a great amount of inconsistent and variability in each of these sources. All this made Indian legal system in classical age maddeningly chaotic. So, how was anyone to decide which was applicable in any given situation? Even just one person could declare the law if he was a learned Brahman. So, we see that uh, what all this meant in practice was that law was what any given group of people or any given place or any given time accepted as law. This made the Indian legal system extremely disorderly but also infinitely, infinitely flex, flexible and were efficient in its own peculiar way. But how could this complex legal uh, system be administered at all. It would have been impossible for any government to keep rack. But how could this complex legal system be admitted at all? It would have been impossible for the government to keep track of all innumerable divergent laws and customs of the subject. The government normally had to administer only the narrow domain of common law, dealing primarily with major crimes and the crimes against the state. A unique characteristic of the Hindu law system was that it was openly based on the principle that men are not equal before law. And this is a real strange difference between today and our concept of law and then all men are not equal before law though practically it may be practiced in our own times. This meant that the magnitude of any crime and the degree of punishment that it entailed was, were among uh, the um, definition of the cases of the found offender and victim. In this view, seeming injustice of the Hindu social system was actually divine justice. So thus, all that divided society was thought that it is divine justice. The judicial discrimination applied to all offenses from the most serious crimes to the most trivial social transgression. And this really meant uh, that uh, uh, the king shall cause his influence for that. 
and there are many numerous and outrageously discriminatory prescriptions in Manu Simriti, Manu's law as we know. Still, the Hindu legal system was weighted heavily in favor of the upper class and by upper class it is meant by upper caste. In chief beneficiaries of everything else in the Hindu world were Brahman. They were promulgators of the legal system and they naturally placed themselves above everyone else and virtually above the power of the state. A common punishment for the Brahman was a shave of his top knot and banish him from the kingdom. But even the king was required to allow him to carry all his wealth with him. Some concession they were given. Only one law book of this period, that of uh, Katayayana, sanctioned the execution of Brahman. The Hindu law books are cursory in dealing with crimes and their list of crimes is haphazard. For their main concern was to preserve the social order by enforcing caste regulations rather than to deal with the crimes. Katayayana gives a surprisingly modern cast to the definition of some of these crimes by including ignorant priests and teachers in the category of cheats and cruelty to animals and destruction of trees in the category of assault. I wish our society can adopt for it, at least where the trees are concerned. There are several exaggerated stories in Indian texts about the punishments meted out by kings to those guilty of cruelty to animals and other living beings. There was a system of uh, separation of powers between the executive and the judicial branches of the government uh, and often the same officers performed both functions. The Indian legal system was an old mixture of theoretical rigor and haphazard practices. Typically, in contrast to the generally arbitrary conduct of law and forces. The lord of one village shall inform the lord of ten villages of the crimes committed in his village and the ruler of ten uh, to the ruler of twenty. So the ruler of twenty villages shall report all such matters to the lord of a hundred and the lord of a hundred shall give information to the lord of a thousand. This is what Manu said and this is what India practiced. Nearly all the civil disputes and most of the common crimes in classical India were dealt with at the local level by the village, caste or guild bodies without troubling the government. There seems to have been also a provision for something like a citizen's arrest in some regions of the India. Police investigation methods in classical India, according to Chinese pilgrims that we have uh, mentioned earlier, were most humane, they say. Fahian reports that there was no torture for suspects in India and Huan Song conquers with this stating, and I quote, in the investigation of criminal cases, there is no use of rod or staff to obtain proofs. In questioning an accused person, if he replies with frankness, the punishment is proportioned accordingly. So it means the acceptance of crimes lessened the punishments. A commendable aspect of the Hindu law books is that they stress that laws, whatever they are, must be rigorously, fairly and speedily enforced. A judge, the king had to set aside all his personal desires, if he was a judge, likes and dislikes and deal with cases guided solely by dharma. So here it is that the objective justice was trying to make a way in Indian society. In criminal cases, the king had the indispensable duty of punishing criminals, even if the criminal and his victim had come to a settlement between them. But the king's role in civil cases was limited. In all legal matters, 
civil as well as criminal. The king was the final judge and he in his judicial role was assigned uh, to have many uh, royal officers as his uh, for the assistance. Although the king was the final authority, in all legal matters, lawgivers characteristically endow Brahmans too with absolute judicial power. A Brahman who knows the law needs not bring any offense to the notice of the king. Aha, this is how Manu saves them. No judicial uh, procedures were involved in summary judgments by kings and the Brahmans. And the first step in the judicial process according to Kakatya was of the judge to interrogate the litigant about the nature of the complaint, asking him, what is your complaint? Have no fear, speak out. So once a case was filed, the litigant could not resolve it through private compromises. If he did, he had to pay a fine. So there was a provision in the Indian legal system of interested parties to participate in the court proceedings of a case even when they were not directly involved in the particular case. Law books classify evidences into two kinds, temporal evidence of witness, document and so on and supernatural ordeals. Of these primacy was given to temporal evidence Ordeal was recommended only when the evidence failed. And for evidence to be effective, it had to be presented on time, otherwise it would be of little use. The judge was required to urge witnesses to speak the truth, warning them of consequences in the afterlife for not doing so. So the idea of a permanent punishment was there too. A major uh, problem vitiating the judicial system in India at all times was the presence of false witnesses in medieval India. They were even professional witnesses for hire, you see. Even this continues till date. Um, in if the judge was unable to decide the case on evidence, he could resort to trial by oath or ordeal. Let the judge cause a Brahman to swear his veracity by kashtariya, by his choice or the animal he rides and by his weapons. So for everything of repute and honor, the king was warned about while uh, deciding a case. That is um, what we find in uh, Indian history written by many of the writers or the historians. Law books specify several measures for dealing with judicial corruption. <clears throat> Another problem, perverting the administration of justice in classical India was the presence of frivolous, moronic judges. So it is very important to have a befitting person as a judge. <coughs> Excuse me. Indian texts generally advocate compassionate treatment of criminals. And compassion, I think, is a backbone of uh, of justice. Even these ideals uh, as to, to avoid inflicting suffering on the criminal's innocent family. And these two Chinese travelers again say, King governed without corporal punishment. Criminals are fined according to circumstances. So it means that the life was uh, respected and certain rights to live were respected too. Uh, unfortunately, this world existed only in the fancy of pilgrims who were imagining what they wished to see in the land of Buddha and not describing the actual conditions there. Here it comes the role of uh, history that how it could uh, manage 
how it could manage to communicate the truth. Harsh corporal punishment was the norm in classical India. And in the offense is light, if the offense is light, I am quoting, the culprit is tied to a wood frame and given 50, 70 or up to 100 blows with a stick. So condemned criminals were sometimes used for human sacrifices in temples. This is scary. Imprisonment of criminals was another mode of punishment in classical India and is mentioned in several texts. Law books also precisely prescribe various expiatory uh, penances for offenders. For offenders, this applied mainly to social and religious transgression, but sometimes also to criminal offenses. Generally speaking, village justice was far milder than royal justice. By far the most gruesome punishment described in the law books are curiously divine punishments in the hereafter. And finishing with Manu that they followed religiously, with whatever disposition of mind a man performs any act, he reaps its result in future body endowed with the same quality. And this is how Manu concluded his idea on justice.